Hello and welcome to ARC Talks, the webinar series brought to you by the Amyloidosis Research Consortium. My name is Isabel Lusada and I'm the CEO and President of ARC. I'm also an amyloidosis patient and know firsthand the challenges that living with amyloidosis can bring. And that's why I'm particularly excited about today's talk on what deals with managing your amyloidosis. We have two exceptional speakers, Sarah Dalhauser, occupational therapist, and Sarah Boyd, physical therapist, who are both part of the Neurological Rehabilitation Clinic at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Today's talk is going to focus on managing your amyloidosis. And so many patients struggle with the challenges and everyday tasks that neuropathy can bring from difficulty using your hands to challenges walking, shortness of breath, dizziness and fainting, and physical weakness, which are symptoms for so many of us. So I'm excited that as they talk through today, we'll hear about how to increase your mobility and strength, how to make home modifications and improve safety around the house, and as well as dealing with the challenges that many of us experience and have experienced with orthostatic hypertension. So without further ado, let me hand over to Sarah Boyd. Thank you, Sarah. Hello, welcome to this webinar. We are physical and occupational therapists who work at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and we are so excited to be joining you today to talk about exercise and adaptations for managing your amyloidosis. My name is Sarah Boyd. I'm one of the doctors of physical therapy in the Neurologic Disease Rehabilitation Clinic at Mayo Clinic. I've been specializing in neurologic conditions almost five years now, and I absolutely love it being able to meet new individuals and finding ways to help them live their life as best as they can and empowering them by giving them tools to assist with their symptom management and going about their day exactly how they want to. And my name is Sarah Dahlhauser. I'm a doctor of occupational therapy. Um, I'm also part of the neurodegenerative disease rehab clinic um, through Mayo Clinic. And I've been an occupational therapist for about 10 years um, and uh, primarily do a lot of work with the neurologic diseases and um, do a lot of education for uh, patients, caregivers, and students um, throughout the, the state and the country. We have no disclosures for any financial relationships, nor do we have any disclosures on off-label usage. All right, so uh, chances are everyone's here because they've, uh, they've heard the term amyloidosis um, and hopefully have some familiar familiarity with uh, the diagnosis itself, but just as kind of a simple recap of what that means, um, this is essentially a condition where the body kind of produces or just kind of accumulates or gathers um, kind of an excess amount of these amyloids and, and deposits it throughout multiple tissues, multiple organs, depending on what systems and organs are involved in this, that will dictate some of those signs and symptoms that someone may experience. So every person maybe uh, feels different um, symptoms and, and feels them in different ways even. So what are some of those signs and symptoms? These are kind of some of the big hitters uh, that at least are kind of common complaints. So lots of cardiac respiratory issues, um, some dizziness, fatigue obviously, unsteadiness, um, uh, unexpected or unexplained weight loss, all of these uh, symptoms in, in kind of uh, constellation uh, may or may not be experienced. So from our perspective in, in occupational and physical therapy, um, these are some of the symptoms that, that we might have a role in, in trying to manage or um, uh, help modify or help adapt two um, if you're experiencing them. So it's a pretty good range um, and we have, have a kind of a broad swath that we can be involved in as physical and occupational therapists. So throughout the, the, this presentation and um, some of these slides, 
we might kind of have some focuses on some of these things versus other things. But in general, these should be pretty um, easy to kind of cross into your own situation and your own, um, your own issues. So, so we're going to start right off on just reviewing exactly what rehabilitation providers can offer to you in managing your symptoms. And we'll just start right off the bat with physical therapy and the definition really of physical therapists were the movement specialists that are aiming to maintain, improve, or restore your mobility and prevent disability through specialized interventions. And all of these interventions are going to be individualized to you to address your strength, your flexibility, your balance, your posture, endurance, and pain. And as we go through physical therapy, there are many, many types of providers within physical therapy that can specialize in many different health conditions. And really, we want to make sure that you are meeting the right physical therapist so that all of your needs can be met and appropriately met. And for amyloidosis, since it's a condition that impacts multiple systems and really can have a varying impact on how you move and feel, really recommend and strongly recommend to seek out a neurologic-based physical therapist over more of those orthopedic-based physical therapists who primarily see low back pain or shoulder pain. If you are unsure if a local physical therapy facility has individuals who could be more neurologic-based, I just always recommend just calling the office or the secretary and they should be able to say if anybody on staff has neurologic or balance training and they would be the most appropriate provider for you to see. So let's say you find that neurologic-based physical therapist and you have an appointment for an evaluation coming up. Well, what are you going to expect? Really, the first thing is we really wanna have a sit-down discussion with you to talk about your past medical and functional history, your current level of function, what are your limitations, and how are you moving around? So we'll probably get into the nitty gritty of asking questions if you're using any type of walking device, if you've had any falls, how is going out into the community, are you able to participate in your hobbies and the things that bring you joy. Another important part of the assessment is to discuss your goals and what you hope to achieve in rehabilitation. I think it's great for you to be a part of your goal discussion and not just have the therapist take the lead on that. We want to hear from you what is going to make you happy and what you hope to achieve. And the physical therapist is going to be the one that can help rein in any unrealistic goals or expectations and help to bring to a nice kind of conclusion of how are we going to get to the best optimal outcome for you. Then once we talk about your goals, we're going to go right into the physical examination where we're going to look at your general mobility, your posture, look at your strength and range of motion, look at your coordination because that can have a huge impact on your balance and how you recover if you start to stumble. And then we will complete the standardized tests of balance and gait to give us some numbers that we can assess throughout your time in therapy. And based on those observations, that will help dictate our plan of care for you. A big part of identifying who your physical therapy team is going to be is also knowing this is a condition that there may be changes and how I exercise or how I move that might change. And so it's important to have interval reassessments because once those changes do occur, we want you to be able to go back to your team, go back to the drawing board and figure out a new plan of attack so that you can stay living well, have all your symptoms well managed and, and cared for. So we get into the topic of exercise that's 
that's one of the biggest focuses of today's discussions on top of general adaptations for your day to day life and how to make that easier for you and safer. And when we think about exercise and amyloidosis, remember we have to remind ourselves that since it impacts multiple body systems, it's going to result in varying symptoms. Therefore, it was, it's really hard to conduct research in a condition that there are so many variabilities. And so unfortunately, when we're looking at exercise in amyloidosis, there is limited research available. This can really make exercise daunting and, and scary. And I'm sure you probably have had providers tell you to stop exercising, that this is gonna harm you more than help you but that's really far from the truth and we don't want you to stop moving because we all know Newton's first law, you know, a body at rest tends to stay at rest and a body in motion tends to stay in motion. It's just that now we have to go back and think how can we keep you moving but in a safe manner and taking in all the things that you are experiencing and make it a perfect program for you. So, since it's so good to continue exercising, well, then we ask, well, how do I exercise? Obviously, it's not going to be previously, and maybe I might not be improving as much as I previously did. We always have to remind ourselves that, okay, I got to keep moving, but my expectations might have to change a little bit. I'm probably not going to get back um, to lifting 50 pound weights or running 30 miles if I was an avid runner before. But kind of talking through with your physical therapist on, on what can I truly expect to gain from this. And despite limited research available, we really can look at other conditions that share similarities to amyloidosis specifically peripheral neuropathies and cardiomyopathies because nerve and heart involvement can be a symptom of amyloidosis. So we can translate exercise implications and guidelines in these two conditions into our recommendations for individuals with amyloidosis. Even if you do not have heart or nerve involvement, these principles that we'll be discussing next, they're still going to be the safest way to approach any activity or exercise program. So it's going to be able to go across, across the board for whatever you are experiencing. As we dig into the research for individuals with a neuropathy or cardiomyopathy, studies have shown that moderate intensity exercises are found to be safe in individuals. Streckman et al. and Sabiri et al. really have found that moderate intensity program has been found to maintain and also improve your strength. It's been found to also improve your walking speed and your balance, specifically how comfortable you feel standing on one leg. Exercise, especially more in a moderate intensity, can help reduce your fear of falling. You're getting out, you are moving, and that can really assist in your confidence and your mobility. And lastly, it can improve your activity tolerance and assist with your endurance as you go throughout your day. So we know that there's these benefits, but how do we even know what a moderate intensity exercise program looks like? You know, how should you really examine your individual intensity during your exercise program? And this is really where submaximal exercise principles can help guide you and your approach to exercising. When we talk about submaximal exercise, the actual definition of it is where you are exercising to a level where your heart rate is 85% of your predicted maximal heart rate. So to find your maximal heart rate, you take 220 minus your age, and then your submaximal exercise heart rate would be 85% of that. This is not appropriate, nor is it reliable in chronic conditions, especially if you're taking medications that impact your heart rate response, and the fact that in a chronic condition, your heart might not even respond the same way as another heart would in a healthier individual. So with that, 
the general rule of thumb when you're applying submaximal exercise principles is your symptoms are going to be your guide as to whether or not you did too much, you did too little, or you, you find that Goldilocks range where you are just right in your activity level. Here are some of the very general submaximal exercise principles that we talk about day in and day out here at Mayo Clinic in the Neurologic Disease Rehab Clinic. This is so important for how you are going to approach your exercise program. And like my colleague Sarah just said earlier, everyone is going to have a different cluster of symptoms. So everybody is going to be different. You just have to find the right recipe for you and how your symptoms stay balanced. So you have a nice level, level of energy throughout the day and you don't see a decline in your function or your participation. So as you're exercising, there are simple and reliable methods to monitor your exercise intensity with the Borg scale or the talk test, and we'll talk about them in the next two slides. Other things when you're exercising, instead of using really heavy weights, let's use light weights or even no weight and just focus on your body weight. Even if you feel like I could lift 20 pounds, continue just with the five to 10 pounds because your muscle might not have that same capacity to continue with that heavier load. And then you might experience more soreness or more fatigue afterwards. Another thing when you're exercising is perform exercises in a slow controlled manner. There are a lot of exercise classes right now that are so focused on high intensity interval training in short durations of time. And that's not going to be the best approach for your exercise routine. You for sure can go into those classes, but we still want you to be performing your movements slowly. You're not trying to have a race with your, your other partner. You're trying to go at a speed that you still feel in control and you are monitoring how you're feeling. And shorter durations of exercise really will be most appropriate instead of thinking, I'm going to exercise for 45 to 60 minutes. Sometimes individuals might find even 30 minutes at one time might be a little bit too much. So maybe think about distributing your exercise throughout the day. So you can have 10 minutes in the morning, then you can do 10 minutes in the afternoon, then 10 minutes in the early evening. Cumulative, you did 30 minutes of work, but it, it, it was in much more manageable parts. And you can have time in between to rest, recuperate, and continue to have a nice steady energy. After your exercise, this is where monitoring your symptoms is going to be key because sometimes you just feel great when you're exercising. You're on top of the world and you leave the session and you're still feeling good, but then all of a sudden you hit rock bottom and you're pooped. You find that, oh, I can't walk as far as I used to today. Uh, the stairs that used to be quite easy for me at the end of the day. Now they're becoming a little bit more challenging and I'm finding I'm a little bit more short of breath earlier on. Maybe you find that you're a little more unsteady or your hands, maybe they're a little bit weaker where you, you couldn't open up a water bottle or hanging on to forks was a little bit harder. That is all kind of indications that your exercise program that day or even the prior day maybe was a little bit too challenging. So when it is more challenging, think about, okay, I gotta modify one of the variables to see what's gonna give me the best response. You can monitor your duration and maybe you cut it down. You can adjust your intensity. So how frequently are you exercising throughout the week? or how fast are you exercising? And then also you can adjust your dose. So how many repetitions of each exercise are you doing? Or how many exercises are you doing in one sitting? 
those are all things that you can adjust. And once again, if you do your exercise program and you leave the session with about the same amount of energy that you came in with, that was the right amount of exercises for you to be doing. If you find that you're still able to go out at night to dinner, you're still finding that you have good balance after you exercise, and then you wake up the next day and you feel good and ready to take on the world, you did the perfect amount of exercise. And that's gonna be different for everyone. So I always recommend keeping an activity log, writing down what you did, and also writing down what you did that day. Because if you did a bunch of errands, like go to Target, Walmart, go get go to get a haircut, and you did that all on top of your exercise program, and you find out that you're pooped, you might also have to kind of adjust how much you are doing in a given day as well. So it helps you kind of plan around what you should do and also assist with your modification of your program. So before we were talking about, well, how do I even monitor my intensity as I'm exercising? And there are two really simple tools. One of them is the BOR grading a perceived exertion scale, and the other is the TOC test, which is what I will talk about next. And this BOR grading a perceived exertion scale is assessing how hard you feel your entire body working, not just one body part or one system. So sometimes we have individuals who say, well, my legs could have kept on going, but my, you know, I was short of breath. But since my legs weren't tired, I kept, I kept working. Nope, you gotta look at the whole you. And since you were experiencing more shortness of breath, that was becoming a little bit harder to talk, then that's an indication that you are probably working hard and you should adjust and start bringing it back. When we look at this scale, it describes your exertion from no exertion at all to you're working very, very hard. And as you can see on the chart, the scale starts randomly at six and goes to random number 20. And you might be asking, well, why, why does it randomly start at six or 20 and not just a one to 10 scale? This is really because this scale has been shown to be correlated to actual heart rates. So the calculation is multiplying your perceived exertion rating by 10. So for example, if I felt like I was working at a fairly light pace, that is a 11 to 12 on this scale. When I multiply my 11 to 12 by 10, I should expect that my heart rate is about 110 to 120 beats per minute. But as we said, you know, your heart rate, that's not really a very reliable measure to look at in any type of condition that could affect your heart rate response or if you're taking medications that blunt your heart rate response. So really, we just want you to go by the description of how you are working and how you are feeling. And ultimately, we want you to aim for, I'm working fairly light to somewhat hard on my whole body assessment. The other assessment is very simple, the talk test. So if you can have a nice conversation with somebody, but maybe not sing, that is actually the amount of intensity that we want you to be working at. If you start to get to the point to where you're having a hard time keeping up a conversation, you're needing to have a couple breaths in between each words. You're working a little bit too fast or maybe you have too much resistance pushing against you. So slow down or reduce the resistance at which you are working. So approaching any exercise program or regimen in a submaximal exercise manner will really ensure that you maintain adequate energy throughout your day and also assist with symptom management. When you think about exercises that you should be incorporating, the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention really recommend to have a variety of exercises and aiming for at least 150 minutes of moderate activity 
throughout the week. And that is the term that we want you to remember. It's throughout, not just in one day, I have to get 75 minutes and then another day, another 75 minutes of activity and exercise. And this is true for even an individual with a chronic condition like amyloidosis. It's still applying the same principles of submaximal training as we just discussed with performing the exercises in a slow controlled manner, exercising in shorter durations such as 30 minutes or maybe splitting that up throughout the day, so three bouts of 10 minutes. And then another change is just your organization of exercises. You can still successfully complete these recommendations by just spreading your exercises throughout the week. So strengthen every other day. So then you have a day's rest in between for your muscles to fully recuperate, recover and gain back that energy. But it is still so very safe for you to do endurance, flexibility and balance exercises on a daily basis. So this is a nice scale that I like to use that just kind of looks at different positions that exercises can be done in. It goes from standing to seated to, to laying down or supine. And this is really kind of based on your falls risk. That is kind of the biggest determin determining factor whether or not you're gonna be safe to do standing exercises or if you're at a higher falls risk, maybe we should focus more on seated or laying down exercises. And this is where I'm gonna repeat that at times you're, you're not going to be able to do some standing exercises, but you can still get a very, um, you can still receive the same amount of benefit and same amount of activity by doing things when you're sitting and laying down and it's still gonna be beneficial. It's a very different mindset because if you're used to doing big exercise routines with heavy weights and now you're doing seated or laying down exercises, that, that can be hard to kind of wrap our head around. But ultimately, we want to keep you moving and you can still maintain your strength, maintain your endurance, maintain your flexibility. And that's going to help out with your symptom management and also help out other symptoms that you might be experiencing, such as orthostatic hypotension, which is what we will talk about um, in another slide coming up, and also help out any swelling that you may be having. So you can still be doing such a positive impact for you, your function, and just how you feel throughout the day, no matter what position that you're in. But here are just some general standing, sitting, and also laying down ex exercise examples that you could safely implement right now after our webinar. When we're thinking about standing, the biggest thing is safety. So we really want you to be standing next to a kitchen counter or a railing so you have hand support. And you can even place a chair behind you so you could have that to rest if needed. One of the exercises is a simple side step. So slowly take five steps to the right, then take five steps to the left. Try to maintain a nice upright posture as you're doing that and try to softly place your feet on the ground. This helps improve your balance and it helps maintain the strength of your hip muscles, which is so important for going up and down stairs or or walking. If that is too challenging, then just take a side kick instead of a side step. Another exercise that you can do in standing is a squat. So keeping your bottom muscles nice and strong to help you continue to safely get up and out of a chair easily. Once again, going up and down stairs. So with the squat, we want you to pretend as if you're sitting back into a chair by sticking your bottom back. Try not to let your knees past your toes. And if you really emphasize sticking your bottom back, you're gonna have great technique and form. 
and then return to a full standing position, emphasizing hips under your shoulders. Don't keep a little mini squat position after you stand up. We want you fully straight because that's gonna further help improve your posture and your balance. If we go and look into more sitting down exercises, try to sit on a firm surface. Once again, upright posture, we want you to practice that for all the exercises. Three exercises that you can start to incorporate are marches, your seated kicks, and bear hugs. So with the marches, it's just like you're in band, march right and left knee raises, nice and slowly and softly place your foot back on the floor. Try not to lean backwards because then you're also going to encourage more of your core strength. The second exercise, your knee kicks. You're just gonna slowly straighten your knee, hold that for three seconds, and then slowly lower. Once again, do not lean backwards because we want your core to also be activated. Lastly, bear hugs. Spread your arms apart at shoulder level to open up your chest. Then you bring your arms across your body to give yourself a hug. This is really helpful for encouraging upper back mobility and maintaining that nice upright posture. Three exercises to do when you're laying down that you could do before you get out of bed in the morning, or you could try to do them before you go to bed at night. Thinking about a bridge where you bring your heels and your feet up, position your heels as close as you can to your bottom, and you're going to lift your bottom up into the air. Try to hold that position for three seconds and then slowly lower. The big thing with the bridge, if you find that you are getting a hamstring cramp, try to reposition your heels even closer towards your bottom and that can help reduce that cramp. Another exercise, a heel slide. As you're laying on your back with your knees bent, you're just going to slide one foot down to the end of the bed. Then you're gonna slide the foot back up to the starting position. Repeat on the other side. That's gonna help your core. That's gonna help improve your hip flexibility and strength and your coordination. Last one, a hip dropout. When you are laying on your back and your knees bent, keeping your feet together, you're just gonna slowly lower one knee out to the side and return to the starting position. You do not have to bring your knee all the way down to the bed because that is one very flexible position that you have to enter. Just go to the point that you have control and that's comfortable. Then you're just gonna repeat on the other side. These are just examples of exercises. We still highly recommend you seeking professional assessment and recommendations from a neurologic-based physical therapist to once again, really have a sit-down conversation with you, find out what your goals are, what you're having difficulty with, and then figuring out a plan of attack of how do we make you safe? How do we keep you strong, keep you flexible, keep you doing the things that you want to do? And that could be adjusting your expectations of, well, what am I supposed to expect with an exercise program? And the biggest takeaway is knowing exercise is still so good for you to do, and we do not want you to feel afraid to exercise. It's just a different approach. It's not no pain, no gain. That is not the strategy. It is now using your symptoms to be your guide. And that is why you have your rehab team to really talk through things to help you problem solve to best manage your symptoms. Okay, so like uh, my colleague Sarah talked about a little bit, um, one of the, the symptoms that can impact not only your tolerance to exercise, but then also um, impact some of your day-to-day -day activities and how you perform them is what's called orthostatic hypotension. So what this essentially means is that this is um, kind of a dramatic uh, drop in your blood pressure that commonly occurs when you're transitioning positions. So um, a lot of times this will happen when you've been sleeping at night and then you get up first thing in the morning and you start walking to the bathroom and before you know it, you're dizzy 
feeling lightheaded, vision goes blurry, um, and you get a little confusion. This is what's called orthostatic hypotension, okay? So um, on top of some of the other uh, kind of more medical approaches that your uh, physicians might take in terms of managing this, um, we have kind of some simple modifications and sort of lifestyle uh, uh, adaptations that we can try to implement that can reduce this um, for you on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, the kind of first and foremost, kind of the big gold standard is wearing compression stockings along with an abdominal binder. So what these compression garments will essentially do is um, kind of squeeze uh, your limbs, squeeze your stomach, um, and help so that your blood doesn't completely drop down to your stomach and your legs, um, causing that big transition, but it'll essentially kind of help keep uh, somewhat of a homeostasis um, in your blood pressure so that there's not such a gigantic fluctuation in that, um, in that change. So the other thing that we can do is just kind of sleeping with the head of the bed elevated. All it takes is about four inches. Um, if you have acid reflux disease, you should be sleeping with your head of the bed elevated anyway, so you get kind of a twofer on this one. Um, and essentially what this does is it kind of allows you to sleep in a position that is a little bit closer to being upright so that then when you wake up in the morning and you transition to that full upright position, the, um, the change isn't as dramatic as it would be if you were laying completely on your back for the entire night. Uh, avoiding heat. This is um, a good one uh, just because heat essentially kind of causes us to um, have what's called vasodilation. So our, our blood vessels get a little bit bigger. It causes better blood flow. But in this case, when you already have um, blood flow changes, this is going to kind of create a more, more problematic scenario. So obviously, if you're living in Arizona and Florida, this is going to be a really tough one. <laughs> so things to consider are going to be, you know, do you need to go out during those really peak times of the day when it's going to be at its hottest, when it's going to be at its most humid? Or should we try to schedule um, appointments and activities to be more towards the beginning of the day or kind of later on in the evening, closer to five or six? Um, if you have an automatic car starter, that's not just for us people in the frozen tundras of Minnesota. It can also be useful during the summer times, um, kind of getting your car started ahead of time um, with the cooling system on rather than the heat. So that way, when you do have to go out to your vehicle and go out in the community, you're not sitting in a steaming hot car for five, 10 minutes until it gets adjusted, okay? Um, other considerations are just gonna be the type of fabric um, and the color of fabric you wear when you're out and about. Um, you want stuff that's breathable. You want stuff that isn't going to attract kind of the sunlight and keep it kind of locked in. Um, so you want more of those kind of uh, neutral, lighter tones and um, some more of those, like I said, breathable fabrics um, can help with that. Um, and lastly, in terms of lifestyle modifications, just incorporating physical counter maneuvers, which we'll talk about a little bit more on this next slide here. But this is kind of a matter of habit and routine, um, something that you sort of get used to doing um, before you make those big transitions um, in your body movement. Um, and you try to make them kind of as easy and seamless as possible. So that way uh, you don't forget about them and then kind of put yourself at a uh, risk of orthostatic hypotension and potentially a fall. So what are those uh, counter maneuvers? This is essentially using your own body's muscle contraction to help uh, either maintain or reduce the severity of the orthostatic hypotension. Um, so uh, essentially our body kind of relies a little bit on that muscle contraction to a degree to kind of help kind of tense things up so that um, it kind of um, can move blood around, but almost in an intentional way. So 
um, one of the uh, recommendations is the kind of three simple exercises that you can do. All you need to do is about 30 seconds of them in a, in a given time um, and consecutively. So um, when you get out of bed in the morning, before you even go up to stand, first thing you wanna do is start with your toes. Get those toes pumping. So you're gonna get the feet flat on the floor and lift the toes up and down, both feet at the time if you can, but lift them up and down, up and down, up and down at your own pace, the way you can do it for 30 seconds. Okay, so we're starting the furthest point away from the body and then we're gonna work our way up to those thigh muscles. So thigh muscle co-contraction, that means you're using multiple muscle groups at once to perform kind of uh, uh, similar activities but kind of lock themselves in place. So this means you're gonna kind of squeeze your thighs, um, squeeze all the muscles you can kind of think about in your thighs. You're gonna squeeze those on and off, on and off, on and off. Okay, you're gonna continue that again at your own pace for 30 seconds. And then lastly, we're gonna move all the way up to the hip and we're gonna do a little bit of those uh, marching uh, exercises that Sarah Boyd has already talked about, um, but using them more in a, in a strategic manner to counterbalance some of these uh, orthostasis um, symptoms. So marching in place, again, just gently lifting the feet off the floor, alternating right and left going at, the, at your own pace. Once you've gone through this, so a minute and a half of your time, then you're going to transition to let's stand, see how we feel, and then go. So all of these things um, considered, uh, you know, some of these strategies are things that an, an occupational therapist typically is going to be able to help you kind of problem solve through or um, kind of help educate you on. Um, Unfortunately, most people are uh, pretty familiar with physical therapy, either through their own experiences um, or just kind of knowing uh, about physical therapy through family or, um, or uh, other articles or um, news uh, stories related to physical therapy. Occupational therapy is a, a little lesser known, um, but still vitally important to kind of your, your care and kind of helping you maintain uh, the lifestyle that you would like um, uh, to maintain. So what is occupational therapy? Essentially, uh, we're part of the rehab team. We're looking at um, how is what's going on impacting your ability to be safe and independent in those day-to-day -day activities. And then we kind of say, all right, can we make this better? Can we um, can we tweak how we're doing things to make them easier or do we really have to change the environment or the activity itself so that we can facilitate you being as independent and as safe as possible, okay? Um, our big focus is kind of on your activities and what is it that's meaningful to you? How can we help you achieve that? So <clears throat> with that in mind, um, occupational therapy, we're, we're slightly different um, from our physical therapy counter, uh, counterparts. Uh, we don't necessarily have people that have specialties. Um, you know, we, can, we have people that work in hand clinics that do get specialty certifications. Um, but for the most part, uh, if you go to a place that's going to have a neurologic uh, physical therapist, they're probably going to have a neurologic um, minded occupational therapist who can not only address some of those neurologic needs, but also deal with some of those hand specific issues, um, mental health in terms of coping and stress relief, because this is a diagnosis that, you know, it's, you got to find some good ways to kind of um, find meaning in your life, find some uh, good ways to get some stress out, um, it, you know, not only for, for yourself, but then also caregivers as well. So OT can kind of help facilitate some of those things um, uh, just based on kind of our backgrounds and our educations. So much like uh, physical therapy, things that you can expect from an evaluation would be for us, since our big focus is on your daily activities and your safety, um, we gather what we call an occupational profile. So an occupational profile is going to include 
uh, essentially your previous level of function. So if we're seeing you for the first time, if this is your first appointment with an OT ever since having amyloidosis, we're gonna be really interested in how things were how things were prior to this diagnosis and prior to these symptoms that you're experiencing. If you're coming back and you've seen us a couple times, then we might say, okay, well, how are things now in comparison to when we saw you two years ago? What has changed? What's different? What can we help you with now? Um, home setup is a big part of our conversation. Again, our focus is on safety and independence and where physical therapy is going to focus on the mechanics of how you're walking, how you're getting around, and what are the limitations there. We're gonna look at the safety in terms of the environment that you're enabling uh, or engaging in within those activities, um, but then also how you're performing those activities. So home setup tends to be a big part of our conversation um, and evaluation and potentially can lead to uh, some of those recommendations that we have in our intervention. Um, and I think we'll go through, we have a good slide that has some of those uh, ideas for uh, recommendations for home setup later. Meaningful activities, um, like I said, we're, uh, we're focused on how can we help you engage in, in the things that you want to do. This is all about quality of life. So what is it that's gonna make you happy um, to engage in? What are some things that, you know, if I, if I don't do laundry and I give that up because, so that I can have the energy to go golfing, then that's your prerogative. And I don't blame you one bit. So we kind of help suss out um, and specify what those meaningful activities are. And then finally, social supports, right? So who do you have in your life that is um, facilitating you? Um, what, what might you have going on in your life that might be limiting you or creating some barriers for you? Um, and, and essentially we kind of want to know who's, um, who's going to be around to kind of help you with things if you need it and who can, um, kind of help guide you, uh, when necessary. Okay. Um, we're also going to do some physical examination, um, looking at the strength of your hands, um, in terms of grip. So how strong you are, um, how good your pinch strength is that has a huge impact alone in your ability to um, manipulate tools, brush your teeth, get yourself dressed, um, get yourself fed. Um, so we wanna know how well, how well those fingers are moving and how strong they are, especially in terms of coordination as well, sensation, um, and maybe even cognition, right? So if there's changes in some memory or changes in problem solving, uh, we want to know that as well so that we can kind of help find some of those uh, easy solutions to kind of keep you independent and safe in that regard as well. As with physical therapy, interval reassessments are encouraged. Um, I normally end up talking to a lot of my people about um, you know, don't wait until you have a, 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 a giant pile of things that are problematic and troublesome for you before you come back to us. We would much rather see you if you've got a couple little changes here and there and hey, let's just tweak how you do this or hey, let's add this exercise for your hands. We would much rather see you in that regard than to have you try to struggle through and deal with these things for years on end and then finally get to us and well, we had this really cool tool that we could use, but darn it, it's a little too late for that. So we'd rather probably see you more often than, than not. So um, with occupational therapy, we're, we're kind of known for our tools and our technologies. So um, a broad term that is used to describe some of our tools that we use to facilitate your function is what's called assistive technology. Now the term technology I think throws people off a little bit. It makes us think of our, our computers and our phones and um, literally the entire world that we're living in <laughs> uh, nowadays. But truly the, the definition of assistive technology is any item, any piece of equipment, any software program or product system that's used to increase maintain or improve functional capabilities of a person with disabilities, 
okay? The key with this is that this can be either low tech or high tech. So um, this can be adding something to your um, toothbrush or your utensils to make them bigger and easier to hold. It can be uh, getting a magnifier to help you with your vision. It can be um, kind of a, a cool app that you get on your phone to um, turn your lights on and off when you need to so you don't have to get up and uh, physically walk over to do it yourself. Or it could be, you know, your, your iPad or um, your other, other uh, device to help you um, remember activities or uh, remember appointments. So it can be a, a very broad swath of, of tools and devices that are essentially focused on enabling your independence. So what we're gonna do these next couple slides are split up into kind of the, the, the main groupings, I would say, of uh, assistive technology or uh, devices um, that are going to um, help you be able to independently engage in some activities. This is a very small um, portion of those devices. So um, it, is not, it is not at all a representative of everything that exists out there, okay? These are probably just the main ones that we end up pulling out of our uh, toolbox uh, whenever we have someone with sensation issues, with imbalance. Um, some of those issues that can be pretty common with amyloidosis. So first uh, device is what's called an auto assist grab bar. This particular one is called a uh, handy bar. And what this does is kind of hooks into that. You see how it hooks into the little D-ring um, that's attached to your car frame itself. So it's essentially the, the part where your door closes and latches onto your door frame. That's the part that this little handy bar goes into and it slides in and out so that you can close your door. Um, but what it does is essentially allows you to be able to get a little arm support so you can boost yourself up or slowly lower yourself down. Um, so that can be pretty nice, especially if you've got a little bit of a lower car. Foam tubing, this is uh, definitely the low tech end of our assistive technology that we provide to our patients. Um, these are essentially um, foam uh, of different densities that have um, kind of burr hole cutouts um, that uh, utensils, tools can slide into. And essentially all it does is increases the size of the handle that you're holding. So good examples that they have up on the screen here are, um, are a pencil or a pen toothbrush, a razor, um, forks and spoons are common for these as well. So it just requires less hand strength and hand energy to hold on to those items when they're a little bit bigger. Um, so, and that's really easy. They slide on and off. Um, so you can kind of take it on the go too. Dysum, uh, Every occupational therapy gym in the world, I think, has some Dysum. Um, so this can either come in just like giant industrial rolls or come in uh, placement pads. So this kind of has a combination of both. There's a, a placement pad on the table that hold the plate from moving and sliding around. But then also there's sheets that you can get that then you can wrap it around objects, you can put it on other objects, and essentially it's a really kind of tacky sort of a mat or sort of a substance that really gives you a good grip on whatever it is that you're holding. So super easy, super low tech, um, and uh, doesn't ruin things if you add it onto them or stick it onto the, the Dyson. Uh, rocker knife, these are my little mini guillotines, I call them. <laughs> um, so these are great for uh, cutting, cutting up vegetables or cutting up meats, um, kind of independently being able to cut up and um, uh, prepare your own meals. Because um, sometimes the way that you have to hold a fork is so abnormal if we don't have great strength. So what this allows you to do is, like you see in the picture, it allows you to hold it in a pretty neutral position 
and then you're almost using more of your body's weight or your arm's weight to push and then rock back and forth. So you cut in a rocking fashion as opposed to a sawing fashion, which is a, a little bit more work and a little bit harder to control um, when you are uh, dealing with some hand weakness. A key turner, so this is um, a little option that, um, I, I mean, basically at this point, now that cars have kind of transitioned to key fobs, <laughs> this is really uh, only an option for kind of door keys or um, keys to like your garage, whatever it might be. Um, so essentially it, it kind of has multiple slots there that you can slide your key, um, that key hole through, and then there's a little screw that goes through so it, it essentially creates a bigger handle um, for you to hold on to, but still be able to manipulate that key pretty easily. And you can see there's normally like three places for keys. Um, so you can get kind of up to three keys on that. There's obviously a big variety there, but this is probably one of the most common ones. Uh, as we talk about compression stockings and abdominal binders that are helpful for managing um, orthostatic hypotension. The big problem with compression stockings is how the heck you get them on, okay? It requires a lot of hand strength. It requires probably some pretty good mobility and maybe even a really patient caregiver. So a stocking donner is kind of the best of both worlds. It allows you to um, independently get the, the compression stocking on your foot um, with as little frustration as possible. It kind of takes a little bit of tweaking and practice in terms of how to use it. But um, overall, I think uh, this particular uh, product is, is pretty slick in terms of being able to help you independently do that. Lastly, for this group, big one, the button hook. Um, so the button hook is basically just a little piece of wire that's attached onto a bigger um, handle. And essentially what it does is it kind of grabs on, you use it to grab onto that little button and pull it through the hole so that you don't have to sit around and fidget with that, um, that button um, in order to get it through that really small hole. The, the button hook will do most of that work for you. Um, the key with this is pulling it um, across your body as opposed to out from your body. Um, all you're going to do with that one is pull your buttons off. Um, so uh, just a little kind of helpful hint there. Now on to some of our home safety equipment. So these are uh, devices that you can get to put into your home that are gonna enable you to be safe and independent, but not necessarily full-blown modifications to your home. So uh, first one here is a bed rail. Um, essentially what these end up being is just a, a giant piece of plywood that wedges between your top mattress and your spring, ba uh, spring box and um, a handle that comes up out of that. So there's probably hundreds of varieties of these, some that have um, multiple um, areas where you can hold on. Some of them are just kind of look almost like a cane. Um, some of them have legs that go all the way to the ground, um, but all of them are gonna accomplish essentially the same thing that you can hold on to them and help you roll in bed or help you slowly transition in and out of bed. This one, I particularly love this picture because there's no way with where that's positioned that this lady is going to be able to get her legs in. So uh, don't make that mistake. If you get a, a bed rail, put it up towards the top of your bed so that way you can actually use it and get in and out of bed. <laughs> uh, lift chairs. So these are um, essentially recliners, all right? They're recliners that have lifting mechanisms. So it is the, the recliner essentially stays in the same position, but kind of anteriorly pushes you a little bit forward. Um, you know, one of our physical therapists always talks about like, this should be used as kind of a boost to get you to a position that you can stand up from, but it should by no means be the thing that completely pushes you up to standing because 
at that point, it's just going to topple you over. So um, use it to kind of get you to a position that you're high enough that you can then do the rest of your work with your own legs. Um, a lot of times the lift component um, might come separate um, from the chair itself. Um, and there's kind of two different pain mechanisms that can occur with the lift chair that we'll talk about um, a little bit later. Furniture risers, so uh, much in line with the lift chair, furniture risers are meant to kind of boost up some of that furniture to make it much of a less dramatic transition um, from sitting to standing. Um, and these can go on your bed, they can go underneath your, um, your favorite chair, underneath your couch, wherever it may be. It just adds a little extra height. Um, grab bars. Uh, this is probably first and foremost one of the, the biggest safety tools that we recommend straight out the gate with people. Um, grab bars are essentially attached to the wall. Um, and can be held on to, um, to either boost you up, to pull you forward, or as just a stabilization device to keep you from um, falling down or slipping, whatever it may be. Um, bathrooms are normally the big place that a grab bar is going to be. I'm a big proponent for having one vertical grab bar right as you're getting in and out of the shower and then one within the shower um, that you can hold on to uh, wherever it is that you are showering. So something that you can use to stabilize yourself when you're in the shower. Uh, and then uh, an option for around the toilet because a lot of times people don't have a wall right next to their toilet or two walls right next to their toilet. So a grab bar can be kind of ineffective in those situations. So another option would be a toilet safety frame. And the big benefit with a toilet safety frame is actually that it's, it puts your arms in a better, better mechanical position that you're going to be able to boost yourself up a little bit easier with your arms as opposed to kind of a grab bar. You might have to reach a little bit further um, and you really might not be use, able to use your full strength of your arms to get yourself up and down. And those are really easily attached. There's uh, a, like a, essentially a little bracket that you attach underneath your toilet seat itself. Um, so it's not gonna go anywhere, um, which is pretty nice. And a lot of the models have it so that you can slide the, um, the frames wider, narrower, or have one side on, one side off. Um, so they're pretty, they're pretty adaptable, which is kind of nice. Next are going to be home modifications. So these are going to be things that you are going to add to your home that are going to improve safety. So a lot of times they require a little bit more than just um, uh, a screwdriver or something. They might be kind of more permanent fixtures or kind of a, a more higher level purchases, um, but they're all geared towards safety and independence and within the home. So the first one would be a pull down rack. I love this thing. <laughs> um, I think it's probably one of the most underutilized um, home modifications that are, that are out there. Um, but essentially what this does is that rack sits up in your cabinet like a standard rack. And then all you have to do is grab onto that lower bar, which is normally a little bit easier for us to reach at least that position. And then you just pull down. Once you get what you need, you start to push it up. A lot of them will have a little bit of like a hydraulic mechanism that once you get to a certain position, it does the work the rest of the way. Um, so that's a pretty nifty um, adaptation right there. Rope lighting, this one's probably really kind of a low end um, aspect of home modification, but I really like the idea of rope lighting in the bathroom, underneath your bed, um, kind of uh, down the stairs, right? So it, it 
promotes kind of better shadows so you can see the contours you can see things a little bit clearer um, as opposed to just a, a flashlight or as opposed to just um, a nightlight um, and you essentially kind of just install them underneath surfaces or along surfaces the main key with that is just making sure that you don't put it anywhere that you're going to trip over it it needs to be out of the way um, but I really like the rope lighting option to to help. This is especially important if you don't have good sensation in your feet. We don't realize how um, how easy or how hard it is to get around without that sensation. We rely heavily on our feet to tell us where we're moving in space, what surfaces we're stepping on, where we are. Um, and when we don't have that or when it's kind of muted, then we rely more on our vision to create that um, create that uh, sense of awareness. So uh, rope lighting is a good way to get that done. Stair lift, this is a really big question that I get from people um, pretty constantly. Um, these are essentially units that um, are installed onto your stair steps and um, you essentially sit on it and there's um, normally a remote operation system. And what it does is essentially kind of lifts you through those tracks that you can see um, from the bottom of the stairs to the top of the stairs or vice versa. Um, I like this particular picture because it demonstrates that there are ones that can curve around. Um, so if you have a landing or if you have any curvature to your steps, there are stair lifts that you can get that will go around that. So that shouldn't be a barrier. Um, sometimes we get to the point that we're talking about stair lifts and the question is more of would you rather spend money on a stair lift and stay in the home that you have or is it worth kind of foregoing all these modifications and looking at a different home setup that kind of becomes the conversation if we start talking about stair lifts is what it what is it about your home that you really love um, what are all the modifications that you need to make and and what is that essentially worth what we don't want is that a lot of times people will say well I, I really want to use the stairs as my source of exercise stairs should never be your source of exercise during the day um, that's kind of a, a risky area to practice your exercising um, and so um, if it gets to the the point that you can't go up and down those stairs then it becomes a question, can you modify your main floor to make that more accessible for yourself? Or is it worth looking at a stair lift or do we just need to consider a different home environment? So sometimes those conversations can go a little bit hand in hand. This is a, this is a big one and I think it's a really simple one and it's often overlooked. Um, so depending on your doorway width, um, the big issue with doorways is that uh, when you open a door, you still have the door in the doorway. So um, if you have a smaller doorway in and of itself, and then now you're trying to get a walker, a four-wheeled walker through there, that door is taking up space and sometimes makes that, um, that use of that walker a little bit more precarious. So the idea with an offset hinge is that when you open the door, the offset hinge works in a way that the door itself is flush with the doorway or sometimes it can open completely flat. So the main thing is that it takes the inch and a half, two inches of door out of the way and maybe that's all you needed to make that um, transition in and out of the bathroom a little bit easier with the use of a four-wheeled walker or um, front-wheeled walker. Uh, a ramp. So um, this is kind of necessary if you um, have a wheelchair or a scooter um, or, you know, if, if doing stairs is just too problematic, a ramp might be um, what you need to start considering. 
there are portable ramps. So if you, you know, like going to your, you know, the kids, the kids houses or um, going to friends places, um, a portable ramp might be something to consider, but they are sort of hefty. Um, this is kind of a, a portable ramp. Um, you can see how it kind of folds in the middle. Um, but then there's obviously, of course, kind of permanent ramp fixtures that you can get um, if, you're, if you're looking for something that's going to be very stable and unmoving. Last but not least, good old roll-in shower. So this is different from a walk-in shower in that there is no step. There is nothing that you have to step over or threshold that you have to navigate across. This is essentially a flush surface from the outside of the shower to the inside of the shower. Um, and this is helpful to A, if you don't have good awareness of your feet, the last thing you need is catching your toes on a threshold or a step. Um, and then, you know, it, it makes that transition a little bit safer and easier. But then B, if you ever get to the point that you're in a chair and it's hard to walk into the shower, you can roll the chair into the shower, make your transition over to that uh, nice built-in bench over there, and then roll the chair out without having to go up and over um, a, a ledge. So those are kind of the big, the big devices. Some of these things um, that we've talked about, so walkers, wheelchairs, um, a lift chair, scooters, these are all under what is called durable medical equipment, which is treated a little bit differently. Um, it requires a prescription from your provider, um, or if you have a physical medicine and rehabilitation department, which occupational and physical therapy are both involved in, um, the, the doctor in that department is what's called a physiatrist. So um, uh, any of these people can create prescriptions for some of these devices. Um, if we're talking about a wheelchair or a walker, while yes, your provider can create a script, we always recommend that you meet with your OT or PT, seating specialist, whomever it might be, before you go and purchase that item for yourself. We wanna make sure that whatever it is that you get ends up being the one that is correct for you, is safest for you. Um, but then also what we have to consider too is that um, insurance will typically cover a new piece of mobility equipment every five years. So if you haven't had a new condition that has changed your status, um, your mobility status, then they, they will not cover anything new within that five years. This um, was predominantly a Medicare rule, but Blue Cross Blue Shield is another kind of insurance company that has started to follow this same rule. Um, so you really have to kind of be careful with that. And that's where having an OT or PT evaluate you for some of these things um, is not only going to help you consider what you need now, but in four years, what might we look like? You know, is this still going to be appropriate at that time? And what might we meet, need differently um, to help keep you safe at that time as well, since we won't be able to get a new device? until five years. And that's at the very minimum. Even at that five year mark, you're not guaranteed to get something new to replace it just because it's been five years, okay? So there's a lot that goes into that, but um, your local um, medical institutions, rehab centers um, can kind of help direct you to some of the uh, uh, durable medical equipment suppliers or what are commonly called uh, vendors who know the ins and outs of the insurance that you're looking for information from and then can kind of help guide you based on that as well. If you have bracing needs, so one thing that we really didn't get to talk about um, in this just because it was so focused or, or kind of that idea of orthotics or um, braces like ankle foot orthoses um, that can help with, with your mobility that stuff needs to be fabricated through uh, a local orthotist um, in the area. And again, your PT should be able to direct you towards um, who in town can uh, achieve that. 
Um, and typically adaptive equipment isn't, isn't covered, um, even though they're things that can keep you safe or help you be independent. A lot of times they're not considered um, medically necessary. Um, depending on your insurance, you could try to make a case for a shower chair, a tub transfer bench, those types of things, um, but like a reacher or a button hook, all of that, that's, that's pretty much always going to be a no unless you have uh, Medicaid-based um, insurance. So Sarah uh, Boyd had talked a little bit about um, trying to find some connections um, for your physical therapy. Um, one way to do that would be to go through the APTA. So that's essentially the American Physical Therapy um, Association. They have uh, a directory for all the people who are board certified specialists um, for all those specific um, specialties that are listed up there. Obviously, you would want to click for neurologic and then put in your location either through your zip code or through the city that you're in. And then you can kind of uh, give a distance to like, I'm willing to go 100 miles to get to this neurotherapist. Um, so it'll search within that 100 miles. If you're saying, hey, I only want to go 10 miles from my house, then that's, that's what you start with. Um, so this is certainly not a comprehensive list of every neurospecialist. It's just people who have gone through additional um, certification processes. So your local PT might not be on here as a, neuro, uh, a neurologic specialist, but they might still have um, a significant background in treating neurologic conditions. So this is a jumping off point to kind of help you um, uh, and guide you a little bit as well. And then finally, um, our last slide here is just kind of some resources. I think the hardest battle is trying to find um, resources and kind of figuring out what you don't know. Um, and so uh, I put kind of two, the first two on their performance health in North Coast are adaptive equipment suppliers. Um, so a lot of those tools that I had talked about, the button hook, the dice, um, you can get through them. Uh, the National Assistive Technology Database. This is um, a really neat um, website that someone has put together that is essentially a, 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 an amalgamation of all of the um, state um, mandated programs for assistive, assistive technology that we have. So essentially you can kind of type in your state and it'll tell you what program your state offers um, and they have loan, uh, loan pools, they have um, places that you can look and trial devices kind of on your own before you go out and purchase something that maybe is $150. If they have it, you might be able to try it for a little bit and see if it actually really does help. Every state is a little bit different in how they run it. Um, I know Minnesota's STAR program um, is excellent and really in depth, but I know some of the states don't have kind of the same amount of resources um, allocated to it, but um, it's worth kind of looking into in what your, uh, what your group has um, available and um, certainly kind of, again, trying some of those higher priced items that uh, you maybe don't want to break the bank for if it doesn't help you. And then mobility aids, uh, Spin Life um, and Resna um, are both places that you can look for information on mobility aids. Spin Life is a place that you can purchase mobility aids, but again, I wouldn't go around purchasing things for yourself until you've talked to your physical therapist, um, your occupational therapist, and you know what you need. Um, because if insurance pays for something, then they're going to pay to maintain it. If you buy something on your own, then you're the one that has to maintain it, um, uh, make changes to it. You're responsible for all of those things. So it's a little bit more kind of convoluted than um, just being able to purchase something for yourself. All right, so I think that concludes um, our webinar. Um, we want to thank you guys so much for um, participating and, and um, kind of taking time out of, out of your lives to, uh, 
to engage in this and hopefully there's good information um, regarding at least some of the aspects that occupational and physical therapy are involved in but certainly um, not inclusive to all of them. So um, we encourage you to um, seek out some OT and PT kind of closer to you and um, they can help you kind of find the right tools that you need, guide you through the right exercise programs that you need, and ultimately kind of help you and your loved ones uh, kind of optimize uh, living your best life. So thank you.